Okay, my name is Willie Paul. Here's my email address. My uh, websites are huntingshifter.com magazine, openmissource.com, and communityalchemy.com. It'd be great if I could uh, get you guys to introduce yourselves quick so I know what your first name is at least. Okay. Hi. Sunshine. Hi, Yes. Andrea. Hi there. I'm Greg. Jamie. Jamie. I want to talk a little bit about the future and what you guys think about that. What do you see down the road in 20 years? What, what's life in America going to be like for you? I feel very fearful about the future. Fearful and, about what, specifically? Um, just the environment in general. I'm a competitive open water swimmer, and I see a lot of really bad changes happening in our oceans. Mm. And getting a lot, a lot of people getting really sick from surfing and swimming out there. Sir, what do you think about the future? I used to be very like pessimistic about how things are, but I do see some shift, and hopefully it's not just a, a phase. Hopefully it's a, a sustainable way of living that uh, people will, will continue. Excellent. How many people know about uh, permaculture? What do you know about permaculture? You're cheating, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I know that it is. Um, it focuses on um, sustainable living um, within agriculture and um, preservation. What exactly are you preserving when you say preservation? Um, you know? Like food sources, okay. our land. I really would suggest that permaculture is designed by nature. In other words, using natural forms, using what nature off offers us to. Uh, to design living habitats or crops or whatever. Um, everybody has a handout that has these symbols on them. Tell me what you see in terms of motifs or, or uh, metaphors in those symbols, please. Do you see anything that's a pattern or repeats itself? I see constant circles. And I want to say maybe it symbolizes life, especially with the tree. Okay. And I see the two figures by the tree in the first um, symbol, so I want to say like Adam and Eve, so maybe it's the beginning, the end, kind of alpha, omega. I see like branches, like branching off. Right. And then I think there's roots too, so I mean that's also connecting, I guess, the, the, mm -hmm. the earth, the, the love of the air. Are you finding anything that's familiar to you in those symbols that you are using in your work as a student here? Or are those kind of separate mm -hmm. from your reality? It's actually very similar to what we do when we do uh, adjacency bubble diagrams where we have interlocking circles that have mm -hmm. uh, uh, effects upon each other and need to be close to each other in order for the system to work cohesively. Who can tell me what alchemy means or how alchemy works? Um, my definition is trans transforming one, uh, something of small value or little value into something, into a substance of a greater value. Do you, do you have a sense that alchemy could be a spiritual process? Mm -hmm. That you could have a change in your spiritual life? Definitely. With this transmutation? In my work, I'm looking at different types of alchemy. New stuff. I uh, wish I could make gold out of dust, but <laughs> what the hell. So, I would offer that there is sound alchemy, and uh, there's digital alchemy, geo or land, soil alchemy, a, a sort of community alchemy process going on as well within permaculture. My whole uh, charge is to use permaculture as a foundation to then look at alchemy in, in a fresh way and to write new mythologies. When I say sound, uh, alchemy, I'm just talking about music that, that can change your your mood or it can change your life in some respect. There's digital, that's just computer stuff. That could be a cartoon. If you're actually standing in a farm field plowing it up with a, with a shovel, then I think you're getting at this, this soil, this relationship to the soil, and that sort of change in, in yourself and change in the, in the landscape. There's a double change there. And then community building, it's just, you know, what we're doing today, getting together, talking about stuff, maybe uh, having some sort of goal come out of it. Now let's talk about 
power of mythology. Who, who can tell me a little bit about a myth that they know about? A story. How about the Sisyphus? Cool. That's um, kind of an old myth, but that works. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's the premise of the myth? How does it work? What's the message? Sisyphus is a king, Greek king. He's condemned to the underworld, and his punishment is to push a large boulder up the hill, achieving uh, enlightenment or salvation when he gets to the top. Except something always happens to him that when he gets just almost to the top, something happens and the rock rolls all the way back down the hill. And it's the 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 concept of the eternal struggle against uh, odds that are against you, yet the need to push against those odds to create change within one's life. So my Catholic school teacher told me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Joseph Campbell. I, I suspect you've heard of Joseph mm -hmm. Campbell. He researched a lot of ancient cultures, tribes, etc., to find the commonalities in their story and uh, came up with some sort of uh, principles of mythology. He talks about the hero. He talks about the journey. He talks about initiation. These are principles that are found in, in, in stories and mythologies across the, the planet. The hero takes a journey, gets initiated in some way from some struggle, like you talked about, pushing the ball up the, the hill. The hero comes back and talks about that initiation to the community. Today, I am sort of teaching and initiating you guys, perhaps, in some of these ideas. I'm also taking a journey here in this school, because I've never been here before. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to relate some of these ideas into a real world context. I, I want to turn you on to how you can write your own myths and, and give you those tools so you can tell the story. All this is, is going to lead you in a, in a sort of journey fashion to a story or, or a myth. And it could have hero or a journey or initiations with it. So in a sense, um, I'm asking you to consider this menu uh, in writing a narrative or a story. So you're not really writing a story until you, you go through these processes, these steps, these awakenings. Why do you feel that um, composing myths or having a mythology now in an age that seems to be overtly scientific is important or necessary? Well, that's a great question. I'll answer it with the next section of my lecture. I would, I would say that there's a dire lack of uh, uh, sacred in our society. Everything's com commercialized, uh, mass-produced, and discarded. But in my work, um, the, sacred, the sacred becomes really the point of you know, living, trying to d develop a, a spirituality and a sacredness that counts uh, larger than just the stuff we buy and consume all the time. So I, I de developed this model It looks like this. It's another menu, in effect, to get to the sacred in your life. This is the spirit, alchemy, and permaculture is the science, as you talked about. This is the sort of answer to your question. If we can um, combine and integrate spirit, our stories of, of the future, and the science of making food in new ways, perhaps we can get to a new sense of the sacred and have a change in beliefs. So what's sacred and what isn't sacred? And I'll just read it for you. Intention, trust, vibration, protection, these are all components of the sacred. Initiation, journey into community and process is a component of the sacred. And then I want to tell you what I think about what isn't sacred. Artifact, control, money, buildings are not a component of the sacred. Ceremony, ego, competition, those aren't components of the sacred. I think it's clear that I'm um, not really interested in current religion to any degree. I'm writing new myths. I'm redefining how to get to sacred. There's, there's, no, there's no Catholic Church here in this triangle, obviously. So that, that's a little bit of uncomfortableness to some. I have a question. Yes. So regarding um, money, uh, what would be the outcome that would replace 
the exchange of the monetary exchange. Yeah, I would hope that we would do more bartering. We we would just be more more inclined to hello, more inclined to um, share because of our sacred qualities of each other, and that's to see each other as consumers. Do you actually barter? Maybe not at a, at a commercial level, but um, within relationships. I mean, we all have these things of give and take. Like, you know, I can do something for you, you have something for me, and so at okay. some level, I do barter. Awesome. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a cap on that. You can't, you can only go so far with bartering as far as surviving, you know, so. <laughs> That's true. But <laughs> well, within this society, but I mean, in historic societies, I mean, barter was the means of, you know, living, so. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Sunshine, do you barter? Sometimes I do. What do you barter? At work. Like with working, working with other people, working for other people, my time. Ah, time. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the questions I had coming into this lecture was how I could help you with your own uh, artwork or your own philosophies. Do you have any knowledge about how you could redesign some of the stuff you're doing with some of these ideas? <clears throat> I guess just thinking about design and I guess how we putting together how we're putting together these different ideas and how they can work together as a whole or as a team to create a space that is not only sustainable and how it, in the outcome but how it works in the future how it works with the people that it's being used by nice Interested in your feedback? Have I gave you anything, any tools or any, any controversies? I mean, point? all of this to me is brand new. I mean, you hear these words, but you don't really know what they mean. So, I mean, I think this clarified a few things. Um, I did find it interesting about the whole sacred and how Catholic religion isn't in there <laughs> with myself. Um, so, I mean, it's just it's a whole new approach to everything. Um, but I can I can definitely appreciate it, and I can definitely you know, take it from the while we're in the beginning phases of our design, applying like meaningful stories, meaningful reason, reasonings as to why we're doing whatever we're doing, the, you know, within the materials that we use, the locations we choose, just having a, like you said, a belief is sacred to our actual designing methods and not just designing for a look or a style or a fad or whatever, but actually having an in-depth, you know, substantial story behind why. Cool. There's a, a toolkit at uh, Open Myth Source, and it has a lot of uh, references, and uh, I invite you to check it out. And then some of the videos I have done, uh, especially the video I did for this, that's at uh, PlanetShifter.com um, magazine. Yes. So I was on the Planet Shifter and Arcon, and you know I wholeheartedly believe that when we were talking about the buildings themselves not being the sacred, it, it's hard for us because we have so much emphasis on the building in our program. But um, when you were talking about the the story and the intent, I think that has actually caused me to pause and, and focus on it because it really isn't about the material. It isn't about the message the aesthetic. It's how people experience our you know, what we do, our service. We're doing more than just design. We're trying to better people's lives. You're on point as far as the mythos and the intent behind the design. I know that um, Luke uh, has us doing uh, design narratives when we're starting a project, and I think that that feeds into the idea of that mythos or that story that goes along with what the intent of the building is, not the building itself as a shell or an artifice, as, as you said so that the living that goes on is what becomes the sacred or the important rather than, while also important, the things that were used to create that space. Yeah, I would like to end in saying that uh, I have uh, a lot of fears about the future. I think the, the gasoline is going to dry up and we're going to be hungry. And we're going to try to figure that out you know, in a chaotic mess. So if we can find a spiritual way to bring forth permaculture and change some of our values, I think then we can start to make a new society. But we're going to have to do it very consciously. And I guess that's my charge, that's my mission.
maybe instead of us, uh, the third world countries looking for us to be the, you know, the leaders of this society, maybe we should look to them, you know, maybe things should flip flop around, because I know a lot of places around the world, they are doing this still, you know, they are focusing on algae and myths and permaculture, definitely, it's all still sacred to them. Well, thanks guys. Thank you for coming.